everyone. Welcome to West Park Church at home. Uh, we're looking forward to a great Sunday today, uh, worship, teaching, and prayer. Uh, we just want you to know that we love you and we're praying for you. And uh, we're going to start things off with a message from one of our church families. Welcome to West Park Church. Church. I'm Juan Manuel. This is my family, Pimentel Quiroga. And I'm going to share a verse with you. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here we, Here we go. Church at home and in person. person. want to say welcome to all of you who are visiting today. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in to our online service. Uh, we'd love if you could take a moment to jump on the church website and check things out. And if there's any questions you have or there's any way that we can serve you, please email office at westparkchurch.ca. Also, we'd love to be praying for you, West Park. Please let us know what's going on. You can email office at westparkchurch.ca and our staff and elders will be sure to be praying for you this week. God continues to do great things here at the church. Uh, we had an opportunity to uh, bring on three summer students this year through our government grant. Uh, so uh, Matt McVitie, Belin Vacadano, and Danielle Kershaw. So they're helping out with various things around the church, like uh, the maintenance around the property, um, our garden, and our migrant ministry. So uh, it's great to have these students on board, and uh, we're just excited to have them on the team for the summer. Thank you, West Park, for your financial support, generosity, and giving. Uh, you can go to westparkchurch.ca slash giving for all the giving options. Well, we want to stay connected with you. If you could follow us on social media, go on the homepage of our website, sign up for our e-news. We can keep you posted on all the things that are going on. And also, please keep sending in those pictures of you worshiping at home. It's great to see these familiar faces of people we haven't seen for a really long time. Well, I just have a couple announcements to highlight today. First of all, we're having communion. So you can prepare by getting the elements together, but also on communion Sundays, we give you an opportunity to give over and above your regular tithes and offerings to the Benevolent Fund. And some people wonder what that's all about. Well, we have this designated account for us to be able to help families in need who are facing uh, financial difficulty or struggles. So if you want to be a part of that and give towards that, you can uh, indicate it on your envelope, drop it off at the church, or you can email giving at westparkchurch.ca and let us know how much. Uh, secondly, is that uh, tomorrow, August 2nd, the office vestibule is closed. Uh, but it will be open again on Tuesday at 9 a.m. Well, we're going to enter into a time of singing and worshiping God. I uh, just invite you to participate. Do what you can to focus on God's truth today. And uh, let's worship together. Thank you. 
righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name.
Well, West Park, this morning we are going to celebrate the table. We're going to celebrate communion, as is our custom, about once a month that we remember in, in an act of remembrance, in an act of worship, we remember the table, the night in which Jesus had the last Passover that he had with his disciples. After three years of ministry with them, culminates in this moment where he himself, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, establishes and institutes this ordinance, this new covenant. And he establishes it with simple elements, with bread and with wine that are so significant. He, Jesus, as he says that he is the bread of life and that he's creating a new covenant in his blood and it's symbolized by wine, wine of, of celebration, wine of renewal. And so we're going to read from Luke's gospel, the account of, of, the, Lord's of the Lord's Supper. And I hope that this is uh, an opportunity for you to remember and see all that the Lord has done for you. And when the hour came, Jesus reclined at the table and his apostles were with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This is what Jesus does for us. He, as the very bread from heaven, mirroring the idea of the manna from heaven in, in Exodus and the story that Israel had been living through in the first Passover, he takes bread and he breaks it and he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. So take your bread and let's celebrate it together. The body of the Lord broken for you. Then he says that he gave them the cup. And this is the cup of the new covenant, which is paid for in Jesus' blood. This celebration wine, which in Luke's gospel records that Jesus isn't going to have it again until the full celebration, until the wedding supper of the Lamb, until all of the new creation has come and his new kingdom is established. This is the blood of the Lord shed for you. Let's drink it together. Would you pray with me? Father, we do thank you for the gift of the table, of the Eucharist, of communion, of being able to remember the Last Supper in which Jesus institutes for us this ordinance, but also gives us the gift of a new covenant. And so we would ask God that in this moment, as we worship you in remembrance, that we would be filled again with your spirit to understand the deep things, and the deep wisdom of God that has been poured out for us through this act that we, as we celebrate the table together, we now proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And so we would ask Jesus that you would fill us, that you would meet with us, that we, as we worship you, you would be pleased. And we do this for your glory and for our good. Amen. Think for a moment about vision and the human eye. Got this beautiful picture of this baby with blue eyes. Sight is one of the most amazing blessings God has given to us. Now, from a very simple perspective, vision really includes two parts. There is what we would call the central vision, and then there is what we would call the peripheral vision. You can see this is... Uh, up, down, left, left and right. Central vision is really uh, what we are currently focusing on at that moment that's right in front of us. Now, right now, I'm focusing on the camera, although I can somewhat see a fuzzy vision of the walls of our recording studio right now. All the things that lie in our peripheral vision, uh, what matters really most is what lies in that central part.
of our vision because that's what we're focusing on. That's what matters most to us at that very moment. It's, those are the objects that we choose to place our attention on. Now, let's take this idea of central and peripheral vision and let's apply it to the idea uh, of what it really means to be following Jesus, to be in a relationship with Jesus. Now, spiritually, Jesus is either central to our lives or he's peripheral to our lives. He's either one or the other. And I think every true believer wants Jesus to be at the very center of their lives. I think if you're a follower of Jesus, you're watching this, I believe that's what you want. We want him to be <clears throat> central rather than peripheral. However, unfortunately, sometimes other things in life compete with what should take central position, that is Jesus. I think we're all guilty of that all guilty of maybe inadvertently pushing Jesus to the periphery, to the side, to the secondary position. Now, with that idea in mind, today we're actually going to continue our series in the book of Revelation, and we're going to see from a, this an amazing vision that the Apostle John had of the majesty of Jesus and how we can more consistently keep Jesus central to our lives rather than in the peripheral. And I don't mean like just seeing a picture of Jesus in our minds. I don't mean that at all but rather that our goals and our attitudes and our actions and our relationships are framed by and directed by Jesus because we have made him central in our lives. We have made him number one priority. Now, overall, the book of Revelation is meant to be an encouragement to believers during the time leading up to his return. One of the most iconic, memorable shows of decades past was Andy Griffith. You've probably seen some reruns of it. Characters included, there was Andy, and there was Opie, and there was Barney, and there was Aunt B, and a bunch of other characters. Well, one day, Opie was out fishing uh, with uh, Andy, his dad, at a local fishing hole. And Andy asked, Pop, when is Jesus coming back? And he replied, I don't rightly know, Opa. You see, we're not on the planning committee. We're on the welcoming committee. Now, when I saw that, I just loved that. And really today, we're going to learn how to make sure we are doing a good job of being on that welcoming committee because we don't know when he's going to show up. So here's today's big idea. There are four practical habits that can help you and me keep Jesus central to our lives rather than in that peripheral position. Now, the vision in today's passage occurs right after John's fabulous vision of heaven's throne room. And I want to revisit this. I showed this to you last week. I'm going to show you the parts of this vision. It's not a really great uh, painting or a drawing, but it gets all the parts there. So here they are. We saw this last week. There is a door that John sees is kind of this portal into heaven. There is a voice like a trumpet. Then we see God on his throne, and behind him is this rainbow, and there's lightning and thunder. There are these 24 elders. We saw that they were actually angels that are representing the church. There were these seven lighted lamps, which represents the Holy Spirit. And there's this crystal sea, which represents God's vast domain. And there were these four creatures. There was the lion. There was the ox. There was a creature with a face like a human. And then there was the eagle. So these are the elements of this vision, which will actually continue through the rest of the book. Now, the passage today we're looking at is Revelation 5, 1 through 14. And... You can follow along in your Bibles if you want to, uh, or you can just follow along as I read. And let me just kind of reach back. Last week in chapter 4, we saw that John's vision elevated the majesty of God the Father. In this chapter, this vision is going to elevate the majesty of God the Son. Okay, so Revelation 5, 1 through 14, and just follow along as I read this passage. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. 
I wept. And this is John, okay. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice. They say, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and strength and wisdom and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praised and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. Wow. Now that is some vision. Now before we take that apart, I want to pose a question to you that I think is a fair question to ask. Here's the question. Read it to yourself first. Why did God use all these visions and these fantastic images? I think there are three, three things to keep in mind if we, if we can answer this question. The first one is this, to keep the meaning hidden from the oppressors. Uh, it was only um, natural that these apocalyptic visions uh, should be burned even more brightly in the minds of people living under tyranny and oppression. See, the more some government power held them down, the more they dreamed of the destruction of that power and of their own recognition and restoration. But it would only have worsened the situation if the oppressing power could have understood these dreams. So such writings would have seemed the works of a rebellious uh, group of revolutionaries. So these books, therefore, especially when speaking here of Revelation, were frequently written in a kind of a code deliberately couched in language which was unintelligible to the outsider. Now think for a minute about World War II. It was won partially because of something called the Navajo Code that the Allies used to communicate to each other. In 1942, 29 Navajo men joined the U.S. Marines and developed a code that would be used across the Pacific during, during that war. And Germany could not decipher it. These Navajo code talkers, so to speak, created an unbreakable code. So this is something of the idea why John used these fantastic visions. Here's a second reason, or second way we might answer this question. To deepen the faith of believers and further harden the hearts of the oppressors. Now, what do I mean by that? You see, Jesus actually used parables in this way. He used them to keep the spiritual, spiritual attention of his believing listeners, who otherwise might have missed his, his teaching. And for the unbelievers, they further confirmed their hardened hearts, since they did not really understand them, However, we need to keep in mind, Jesus' teaching and what we see in Revelation did shock and stir some unbelievers to faith in Jesus as they heard these stories and as they heard these visions read. So, that's another, a second reason. Here's the third reason why, uh, how we can answer this question. To illustrate similar events in different ways. Now, this point refers to the sequence of events in Revelation that we've started to see, we'll see more of. John recorded these images and events in the order that he received them in the dream, but that does not necessarily imply that they uh, occurred or will occur in that same order. 
many good biblical scholars believe that the, the actual sequence of the events as outlined in Revelation is really not linear, but rather parallel visions that overlap uh, as God expresses the same kinds of truths in different ways. So let's unpack the passage now, okay? So he starts out in verse 1. He says, Then I saw in the right hand of him, that's God, who sat on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. Now, this is a scroll with important truth about the future, how the end of history turns out and what becomes of followers of Jesus and rejectors of Jesus in the end times. Now, nobody has the authority in this dream, in this vision, to open it and read the script, but one, that's Jesus. Only he has the authority and power to open and read this important scroll. And he is worthy of the adoration and praise of everything and everyone in the universe. Now, scrolls were really important in that day and time. They were really made from papyrus. Here's, a, here's the, the plant. And, of course, there's, there's an idea of the scroll. So this, this was a type of writing material in those days. It'd be kind of like the texture of a brown, brown paper bag today. They could be as long as 10 meters when you roll them all out. And the Revelation probably was around 5 meters. And it was based on how many columns they had, how many words they used per page. Usually, they were only written on one side. This one is described as being on both sides, which meant that there was a lot of material there. Now, the scroll would be akin to what we would say today as a last will and testament that contained God's redemptive plan that explains how God will bring history to a close. Uh, bring promised blessings to, to his followers and judgment on those who reject him, which Revelation is explaining this. This is what's happening as, in this scroll. And the vision describes it having seven seals. Now, the seals were meant to be uh, to, really, to hide what was in the scroll until they were broken. The rest of Revelation reveals the content of this scroll as the mystery of God unfolds as we approach the end of history. A biblical scholar, one particular biblical scholar, his name is Randolph Richards, he kind of helps us understand what's going on here. He describes in his, in his writings, he says, in the Roman, Roman Empire, wills, as in the last will and testament, were officially registered and filed at the government office. This was too expensive, really, for most people. And so a person would do it in a different way. A person invited uh, the heir, the executor, and ultimately five witnesses to attend. He would dictate this will to a secretary. Now, when the document was finished, it was rolled up, like you can see here. Each person that attested that it was uh, correct and official, and they would do this by wrapping a string around it, tying the string, then putting a drop of wax and sealing it and this would attest to the validity of this scroll or, or the information uh, in, the w in the will. Thus, the will would have seven seals. When it was time to make the inheritance official, the heir and the executor had to be there and a majority of the witnesses who would attest to, to their seal. Now, the image implies that each seal, when it was broken, would allow a portion of the scroll to be unrolled to a point and the contents um, to, be, to be read until the next seal was broken and more of the scroll could be seen, and so on. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that, that way. All right, now, he continues in verse 2, he says, And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? So this mighty angel shouts out a challenge for anybody who's worthy to come and open the seals. But then it says, but no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. It was as if a silence came over heaven, a great celestial pause. Would somebody step forward to be able to open this seal and, and read it? No takers, because someone worthy enough to open this important document would have to have the rank and character and moral qualities to approach the throne of God. For God himself is holding the scroll. It would require someone beyond a created being to open it. The point is that no one was worthy, had the credentials, the past, in past, present, future, 
from any location anywhere. Not a prophet of old, not a saint on earth, not an Einstein-like genius, not some great world leader, not a, not a godly person from the past, present, the future, or even an angel. Now, this actually affected John when he heard this. Remember, John had been promised in this dream, that he would see into the future and see how things turned out. But now, with no one to open the scroll that revealed the future, would he not see what is yet to come and what had been promised? Even worse, would God's purpose not be worked out? Will evil not be brought to an end? Will there be no protection for believers in the end times? No judgment upon a persecuted uh, world? No, no ultimate triumph of believers? No new heaven? No new earth? No future inheritance? This was going through John's mind. And then this happened. I wept and I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. He was brokenhearted. God's plan been put on hold because there's no one to take the scroll uh, as an agent of God to unfold the end times, the final judgment and restoration of a new heaven and a new earth. Well, then one of the elders spoke up and said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. So one of these elders, again, an angel that represented the church, encouraged John and said that, hey, there is one who can open it. And he uses the past tense in describing the triumph of this person who we know is Jesus. His triumph over death, triumph over hell has already occurred when Jesus died and rose from the dead. And when all the final events leading up to the ultimate banishment of evil and Satan will ultimately be revealed as explanation, uh, as we see the explanation in the book of Revelation. So Jesus is the heir and the executor of the will. More than that, he's like all the witnesses. Remember how wills with multiple seals required that a majority had to be present for the will to be executed. So, we actually see here two names of Jesus. The first one is a lion called the Lion of Judah. And a lion was really an emblem of, of Jesus' kingly authority and power. Then we see this other one, the Root of David. This connects directly with David, who was the great king of Israel. Jesus came from David's lineage, and the prophets prophesied that. Now, these titles of Jesus show us that Jesus had triumphed over evil uh, by the major weapon. That major weapon was the cross. And because of that, he can now open the scroll. See, Revelation really describes Jesus' mopping up operation since the victory was initially won on the cross. But then the image of Jesus changes from this lion to the root of David to, then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. Now, the use of the little word lamb is so prominent in Revelation that it appears 29 times in this book, only once in the rest of the New Testament. It means a gentle, humble lamb. Now, in the Old Testament sacrificial system, the lamb was the uh, typical sacrificial victim. And then where he says here, as if it had been slain. What he's saying here is that he could see that uh, uh, this lamb bore the marks of death, but it is very much alive now. Not only is Jesus seen as the lion, one with power, but also as an innocent, perfect lamb who by his sacrifice, his specific sacrifice, has paid for all of our sins, your sins and my sins. So sometimes we see in literature and images and pictures and Bible story books, this image with the lion and the lamb together. This is where it comes from, the book of Revelation. And John describes it as having seven horns and seven eyes, and horns really symbolize Jesus' strength, and eyes symbolize his all-pervading intelligence. You see, Jesus bears the marks of death, yet also bears the signs of divine omnipotence and divine omniscience. He says, he came and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. 
Now, Jesus hadn't yet opened the seals. We'll see that in the next few weeks. But they anticipate its opening, so they burst into worship. The Lamb, Jesus, note, did not bow down in worship of God the Father, which reminds us that Jesus is as much God as is God the Father. And to reinforce the truth that Jesus is fully God, worship to any other thing or being other than God would be idolatry. Here, Jesus is worshiped because he is fully God. He goes on to say, each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the people. Now, harps were often used in worship in the Old Testament, and the Jewish person understood this golden bowls of incense image. In early Judaism, before they had the temple, they had what was called a portable temple called the tabernacle. Here's a picture of the tabernacle. It's a cutaway. I've actually used this a couple of times. So in these visions, John alludes oftentimes to some of these items in the tabernacle that were later in the temple. Now, this is one of them. There is an altar. I'm going to put an arrow here. Right here, this is an altar. And this altar actually appears right, or it's, it's placed, position right before this curtain. And there's a cutaway of the curtain there. So this altar was placed right in front of the curtain that separated the rest of the tabernacle from the most holy place where God was seen to dwell. And we see this in this image right here. And on top of this all altar, it was called, this altar was actually called the altar of incense. And here is a, a model of this. This would be pretty much probably what it, what it looked like. On top of this altar were these golden bowls. You can see some bowls on the top. Golden bowls that were filled with incense and used in their worship and seen here as representing the prayers of God's people. And it said they sang a new, a new song. Three different times this vision is about singing, and this is the first time. There's a lot of singing going on in this vision, and this is really the basis for the first song. You, that is Jesus, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. You are worthy refers to the qualifications of the person, that is Jesus, who alone have the right to take the scroll and open, break its seals and read it. His worthiness for this task is because of this next phrase. Because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. See, this right was won by his loving sacrifice on the cross. And he offers forgiveness to anyone who repents and places their faith in Jesus. That's the gospel. Now, there's a bunch of angels next, too many to count. They sang another song about how worthy Jesus was. So John's probably already thinking, man, how, this, how, can this get any better than this? But no, this choir expands to include all of creation. A third time they sung these worship songs. All creation gathers around with anticipation, awaiting the disclosure of the great mystery in the scrolls that's open and read. It says to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. What an amazing vision about the majesty and centrality of Jesus Christ. So the question for us is, how do we keep this magnificent Jesus central to our lives? The big idea, four practical habits can help us keep Jesus central rather than peripheral. Now, here's how I'm going to do this. I'm going to actually show you four images that represent these four habits. When I put them up, what I want you to do is see if you can come up with what you think that particular uh, image reflects, okay? That particular habit that that image reflects. All right, here we go. Here's the first one. Give a few seconds to think about what you think that represents. Here's the next one. What do you think that represents? Here's the third one. What do you think that one represents? And here's the fourth one. What do you think that one represents? Well, I'm going to tell you, you probably figure these out. Here's the first one. Persist in prayer because prayer pleases God and he hears our prayers. Remember the incense and the prayer together? 
The golden bowls were filled with incense. Remember this altar and those golden bowls with the incense on the top tied to this image was tied to the mention of prayers. What that means is God cherishes our prayers. He, in a way, he kind of stores them up. They're pleasing to him as, an inc as incense was seen as pleasing to him in the Old Testament worship time. Now, these prayers include the prayers of the martyrs, reminding us that God will render justice, that he will vindicate those who have been persecuting the church and persecuting those who are faithful followers of Jesus. But it also includes our prayers that God considers so precious. So, in Psalm, David actually picks up on this. He says, may my prayer be set before you like incense. So when we pray, it actually brings Jesus back into our center stage, back into where he needs to be. So, habit one, persistent prayer. Here was the second image I gave you. Here's habit two. Serve selflessly. In fact, verse 10 says this, you have made them, that is believers, to be a kingdom and priests to what? To serve our God and they will reign on the earth. He said in the Old Testament, only priests could approach God, could go into the places in the temple that were most holy. If you were an ordinary person, you could not go that far. Now, because of Jesus' work on the cross, we aren't limited in our access to God. In a sense, we are all priests in that we have direct access to him. And you know what priests did? They served God in the temple. In fact, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, for we, followers of Jesus, are God's workmanship. We are created in Christ to do what? To do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are created to serve God. Now, one of the big unknowns that we'll face in a post-COVID church world uh, as more and more of, our, of these um, restrictions are, are lifted from us is this. How many former churchgoers who served faithfully pre-COVID will quit serving in or outside the church? Will some quit because they are just out of habit or because they've filled up their schedules with other activities or because they just don't see the importance of serving? Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, it's pretty clear Jesus expects us to serve and to serve him out of gratefulness for what he's done for us on the cross. Now, I hope you won't be one of those dropouts. But when you are ready, we hope you again will step back into serving this Jesus that Revelation tells us about. So habit two is serve selflessly. So when we serve what we're doing, we're putting Jesus back into that central vision. But here's the third image I showed you. This is probably pretty easy. Make music in your heart. Make music in your heart. Psalm 96 says, sing to the Lord a new song. In other words, put a song in your heart. Now, as these elders and heavenly creatures and angels and all these created beings saw Jesus, they worshiped. And in this vision, they sung. Now, you may not be a really good singer. You may be a really bad singer. We're not talking about your ability to do music stuff. But when you have a song in your heart about Jesus, it will lift up your soul. It will place him back where he needs to be. You can do this by just listening to Christian music and singing along. You can make up songs of praise. You could sing the words of, of the Psalms, the words of Scripture. When we sing, we, when we come together, we're, we're worshiping, we're putting Jesus central. And that's why it's so important for us to come together. Or maybe email Corey Brown, our, our worship pastor, for some ideas. Make music in your heart. Now, I want you to know something very interesting here. Notice the common experience in all three times this singing happened. It was corporate. In all these times, when a new phase of worship began, there was a corporate sense. It wasn't a solo, lone worshiper. Certainly we do worship, you know, by ourselves sometimes. We're singing in the, in the shower and our devotional time. But the example here is this, that we do it with others. That's one of the reasons we need to physically come together so that we worship corporately together as we see here. So when you make music in your heart, what's happening? You're putting Jesus back into that central vision. Now, that next one I added, because of, of current cultural uh, the current cultural climate that we're facing here in North America. 
This one may have been a little tougher, but here it is. Habit four, reject racism. There's a key phrase that shows up several times in Revelation. Every tribe and language and people and nation. Seven times John uses that phrase. See, John writes of this universal offer of redemption to everyone who believes. Doesn't matter their skin color, their language, their nationality. You see, racism and Christianity are antithetical. In biblical days, racial prejudice was pretty prevalent. The Jews and the Greeks and even the Christians and the Samaritans uh, and so on, and the rich and the poor often were not real friendly to each other. And it seems that racism today is rearing its ugly head. Yet, God aff affirms his diverse creation of people, different tongues and ethnicities and skin colors and nations. We see this uh, uniqueness of different uh, people groups and races in the scripture. That's one of the beautiful things about West Park. We are so incredibly ethically diverse. One time we did a study, a quick survey, over 50 nations are represented. We have four different language uh, congregations, and that's such a beautiful thing. Even with our diversity, we're one in Christ. You see, redemption is a universally offered thing that God has done. He has made this universal offer of grace because of Jesus' death and resurrection to every person, no matter skin color, our language, our ethnicity, our race. For in Christ, all believers are one in Him. Yet, at the same time, we recognize and respect and we honor each of our unique and different God-designed qualities. So John records this universally offered redemption a bunch of times in Revelation, which means it's pretty important. So, to keep Jesus at the forefront, here's a little assignment. When you see somebody not like you this next week with a different skin color, a different language, a different different demographic group, you can actually tie back to habit one, persistent prayer. So here's my challenge. In your heart, pray for that person, that God would protect them from hateful people, hateful words, and that he would draw them to himself. Okay, I'm going to test your memory now. I'm going to give you these pictures. I'm going to put just a picture up. See if you can recall the habit that goes along with it. Okay, here we go. What's that one? Persistent prayer. What's that one? Serve wholeheartedly. What's that one? Make music in your heart. That one? Resist racism. So a general challenge to you this week is this. Take these four images and what they, what they reflect and practice them and do them. And I, I pray that God will profoundly impact your life and your heart as we dig into this amazing book as Jesus unveils what the end times will be. Because I've shared several times, it's very simple. Jesus is coming again, and we need to be ready. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for these uh, beautiful uh, images that and visions that you gave John that by your spirit, he recorded in the book of Revelation. I pray that we will have open eyes and open hearts to not just understand what they mean, but to take them into our lives so that we will be Christ followers who place Jesus truly central more and more in our daily lives. And I just wonder for our closest prayer, if you're watching, you've never come to faith in Jesus, Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for you and rose from the dead. If you place your faith in him right now, just through prayer, something like telling him something like this, God, I want to have my sins forgiven. I believe Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead for my sins. Please cleanse me of my sins and make me a follower of Jesus. If that's the desire of your heart, Jesus will come in and he will change your life. So, Lord, we say these prayers. We give these prayers to you. We know how important they are. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining today. God bless. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we hope you can uh, join us next week as we continue on in this series on the book of Revelation. You are love, church. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.